Welcome to St. John's in Battle Creek. I'm Pastor Miller from Plainview. Pleasure to be here with you again this, this week. Um, tonight's services are a little bit different because most of us are, are wearing masks. We're also socially distanced. So as we leave tonight, let's make sure we remember that, to make sure we're socially distant from one another, to avoid possible spread of uh, COVID. Um, with, those, with that in mind, let's begin our opening hymn. Hymn 549, All ha Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Sacred throne, 
Please rise. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Heaven. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? With you there is forgiveness. Therefore, you are free. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in this fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as a people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, the protector of all who trust in you, have mercy on us that with you as our ruler and guide we may so pass through the things temporal that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Be seated for tonight's readings. Amen. 
Our Old Testament lesson for the 20th Sunday of Pentecost is from Isaiah chapter 45. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him, and to loose the belt of kings, to open doors before him. The gates may not be closed. I, go, I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places, that you know that, I, that, is, that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name for the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, that is no, besides me there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me. That people may know, that people may know, from the rising of the sun and from the west, there is one. There is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle lesson is from First Thessalonians chapter one. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of, of, of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. We give thanks to you, God, always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with, and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imita imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word of much, in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example of all, to, all the, of, to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that, so that we need not say anything, for they, for they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers, who delivers us from the wrath to come. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the Holy Gospel and Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Then the, Phar then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle Jesus in his talk. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us, then, what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius, and Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is, is, is on this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar's the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. What when they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We now confess our Christian faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for tonight's hymn of the day. We give thee but thine own. Please rise. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and his loving Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of Jesus, be seated. So there is a warning sign that most of us have seen just before we drive across a bridge. Bridge freezes before road, sur before road surface or watch for ice on the bridge. This, this sign is an attempt to warn us that even though the road may not, you're driving on is perfectly clear, the bridge you're about to drive on is covered in ice. It's going to be slippery. We are getting closer and closer to that time of year when we must take, th when we must take such signs a little bit more seriously. This last Friday morning at 6.39, my wife sent me a text message showing a possibility for, uh, for a snowy forecast tonight going into tomorrow morning. Sorry to ruin your evening if you guys didn't know that yet. I apologize. But the good news is it won't last long if it does snow because the ground isn't frozen yet. But after my stroke, cold weather affects me differently. So I texted her back and said, Honey, I love you, but we're selling the house and moving someplace warmer. I can't do winter this year. <laughs> she didn't think that was very funny. 
just by, by the way. Winter driving can get quite interesting, especially out in the country or these more secluded towns in Nebraska. I can remember driving along at the blazing speed of 20 miles an hour on I-80 on my way home from West Des Moines to Stewart, Iowa. It wasn't a traffic jam, no. The surface of the road was a sheet of ice. Even, tr even the trucks were taking their time. And as I was driving along, uh, I saw a car come on the hot into the highway, and it was going too fast. Apparently, the, the, the entry ramp was clear and dry, and the driver did not know what lay ahead of him on the interstate. I knew this driver was going to be in trouble. I knew I was in trouble because he was about to have a lot more excitement in his day than he really wanted, I'm sure. He hit the ice on the freeway and sped immediately, and sped, and immediately lost control of his vehicle. He was headed towards the center of the ditch or into, or into me and my car, but he managed, he managed to avoid both and went to the opposite ditch. And as I caught up to him, I could see that he was uninjured and using his cell phone to call for help. So I hunkered down from this, low, this long, slick drive home across I-80. I didn't count the number of abandoned cars in the ditches that afternoon, but there were quite a few. No doubt many of them had an experience similar to one I encountered and experienced myself. Of course, dishes have been around for a long time before there were automobiles, and there have been many reasons for travelers to get stuck in a ditch down through the ages. For centuries, thinkers of all kinds have used this idea of dishes as a metaphor, the two ideas that were both wrong but the opposite sides of the truth. In fact, the Pharisees and the Herodians in today's gospel hope to get Jesus stuck in such of a ditch. We've met the Pharisees before, but the Herodians don't get all that much press in the New Testament. The Herodians, as their name implies, were supporters of Herod and his family dynasty. The interesting thing about the Herod family is, is that they were not Jewish, but they maintained their rule um, with the support of the Roman occupation. Ordinarily, the Pharisees and Herodians hated one another, but with a, if it meant they caught Jesus, they were best friends. It says something about desperation among the Pharisees. They were willing to work with Herodians. The Pharisees and Herodians hoped to present Jesus with two dishes with no road in between. They asked this question, is it lawful to pay Caesar taxes or not? If Jesus said no, then the Herodians would have the evidence they needed to get Jesus arrested. If he said yes, then he would instantly become unpopular with the people who hated the Roman occupation. Either way, Jesus would be out of their way, and they could return to life the way it was before, how they liked it. Of course, Jesus, being Jesus, saw their plan immediately. He also understood something that they did not understand. Jesus understood that both civil authority and religious authority are all from God. God authorizes and is in control of both types of authority. The physical kingdom of the power and the spiritual kingdom of grace are not an either-or, but a both-and situation. In our Old Testament reading for today, Isaiah points out, out that Cyrus, the pagan king of Persia, in spite of all outward appearances, was God's instrument. The Lord used him to work out the history for the ultimate good of his people. Likewise, when Pilate boasts of his authority, either to punish Jesus or to let him go, and John, Jesus answered him, you would not have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. And when Jesus said that, therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, he was telling us that Caesar and all government is God's instrument at work in the physical world. Obeying the laws of the land and participating in democracy are part of our obedience to God. Now as interesting as this little run-in was, and as nice as it is to know that how the faithful Christians are also faithful citizens of civil authorities, Surely there is more from today's gospel reading. Here we come to context. Like a few weeks ago when I preached, it's about context, context, and context. This little run-in took, run took place in the temple on a Tuesday before Jesus was crucified. In a few days, he would die, and, and with his death, he would pull us out of the ditches into, the, into which we have fallen because of sin. You see the devil, the world, and sinful flesh drag us into a ditch, one of, one of these two ditches. An investigation of the people in one of the of ditches finds people who look at God's law in a superficial way, and they say, hey, I can do that. 
In this dish, people, in this dish are people who say things like this. I lead a pretty good life. I've never murdered anyone or robbed a bank or anything like that. I pay taxes. I'm faithful to my wife. I spend time with my kids. Yeah, I think there's a pretty good chance I'll end up in heaven. This is a ditch of self-righteousness. This is a ditch that we often associate with the Pharisees. This ditch is full of people who believe that they are pretty good and God grades them on that curve anyway. An investigation of people in the other ditch of the road finds people who are really depressed. They have looked at God's law thoroughly and deeply. They fully understand they cannot keep his law or commands. This was a path, this was the path, this was a path or ditch of, of our friend Martin Luther, who only saw God as an angry God. But then reading the Gospels and by grace, he discovered that by grace through faith, we are saved on account of Jesus. Now, if we were to do an interview with these same types of people, we would hear these thoughts. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. I'm just too old to be saved. No matter how hard I try, I'm just not good enough. After all I've done, there's no way that God will let me into heaven. This is a ditch of despair. The biblical poster child for this, of this ditch was Judas, who hung himself after he betrayed Jesus. This ditch, this ditch is full of people who believe that their sin is stronger than God's forgiveness. These ditches actually have something pretty important and common. They both depend on the self rather than depending on God. The people on the, in the one ditch say, I'm not good enough to get into heaven. And the people in the other ditch say, I'm not good enough to... I am good... Okay, the one, the, one, the one ditch says, I am good enough to go to heaven. And in the other ditch, they say, I'm not good enough to go to heaven. Every time we look to the self, we get pulled into one of these two ditches. Even those who say, I will do my best, and God will do the rest, are in the self-righteous ditch. As long as it is up to me, I'm in the ditch. Just as Jesus stayed out of the ditch with his enemies when they sprang their trap in today's gospel, he also provides a way out of the ditch for us. <clears throat> he instructs us to give, him, to give up on ourselves and rest in him. The people in the ditch of despair are right about one thing, that we can't live the perfect life needed for eternal salvation, but Jesus did. He lived a perfect life, a sinless life, and a few days later after the events of today's gospel lesson, he died a sacrificial death, death for me and for you on the cross. And the following Sunday, he rose from the dead, and 40 days after that, he ascended into heaven, and he did all these things that we confess in the creed, and did them all for you, to pull you up out of the dish that leads to hell and up onto the road that leads to eternal life. In today's gospel, Jesus said, Therefore, render to God the things that are God's. With his sacrificial death, Jesus rendered to God the payment for the sin of the world. That is, every sin for every person who has ever lived, for every person who lives now, and for every person who will ever live until the end of time, he has paid for their sin. He has paid for your sin. He has paid for my sin. All sins are paid for in full. The Pharisees and the Herodians in today's gospel lesson tried to make Jesus ir irrelevant by asking him a trick question. And when that didn't work, they gave up on subtlety. They decided that the only way to remove Jesus from the scene was to remove him permanently from this life, was to kill him. So during the next few days, they carried out their plan and arranged to have Jesus crucified. And when Jesus was dead, the power of sin, death, and the devil, they all thought they had won. They didn't understand that the death of Jesus is his greatest victory. It is by victory that we receive forgiveness of that we that we receive forgiveness, life, and eternal salvation. It is by this victory that even though we die, we shall rise again. For Jesus himself did not remain in the grave, but became the first fruits of those who, who rise from the dead. His resurrection is the assurance that, that the work he did on the cross is the ultimate victory, the assurance that we no longer live in the ditch where we are now safe on the road that leads to eternal life. The coin in today's gospel lesson had an image on it. On the cross, on, on the cross Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, is for us the image of, what, of the invisible God. In that image you see what God of the universe has done to make you his own. He, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for all, how will he not also with him graciously give you all things? 
And for this, as God's people, we all say amen. Please rise. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stay standing for prayer. Okay, I guess we sing a song, then we pray. Okay, you can be seated.
Lord, deliver your people by your power and grant to us grace sufficient for all our needs and for, all the, for the needs of our people. Let us pray to the Lord to open his eyes of the blind by the light of his word and to open the ears of the deaf with the voice of his gospel and for the Lord to clear the way for, for all people to know the riches of his grace, the gift of forgiveness, and the promise of life in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, let us pray to the Lord to raise up evangelists who will witness the gospel, for preachers who will testify to the mighty act of deliverance on the cross by which we have been saved, and the Lord to bless his church and all church workers who serve in his name. Lord, in your mercy, let us pray to the Lord to teach us to trust not in our works, but in his word, and for a steadfast faith to endure in time of test, trial, and tribulation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray to the Lord to bless our nation with peace and harmony, and for the Lord to bless our president, governor, and legislatures, and governors, and those who protect and defend us against all the enemies of our land. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray to the Lord to heal the sick, give relief to the suffering, grant comfort to those who mourn, and give peace to the dying, especially those people, those people we name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, let us pray to the behalf of those who serve as doctors and nurses, for medical researchers and those who, do, who work to end disease, and for those who and for those who care for, for, care for people most vulnerable, Lord, in your mercy, let us pray to the Lord for renewal of our lives of prayer and devotion, interceding on behalf of all those in need and those who have devoted themselves to the Lord's work. Lord, in your mercy, let us pray to the Lord that we remain steadfast and immovable in faith and that we may endure to the day of his coming again when we shall be reunited with, with those who have gone before us and with a sign of faith and now rest from their labors to live his eternal presence and sing his praise without end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, we're mercy in the kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Lord, look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Please be seated for our closing hymn, How Great Thou Art.
Sings my soul, my Savior. my soul, my Savior, God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, my soul, my Savior. 